As traditional Catholics, we talk a lot about a desire to be traditional. We want a traditional liturgy. We don't want the modern liturgy. One aspect that we think is missing sometimes is a traditional Lent. A traditional Lent includes traditional fasting. So here at 1 Peter 5, we are encouraging traditional Catholics to join our lay sodality of fasting where we can restore a truly traditional Lenten practice with traditional Lenten fasting. Jesus is King. Welcome to the 1 Peter 5 podcast, Rebuilding Christendom, Restoring Catholic Culture and Tradition. I'm Timothy Flanders, Editor-in-Chief of 1 Peter 5, and I'm joined today by Matthew Pleasy, the author of this new book, which I'm going to show you in just a minute, and three of our friends, Wes from Washington, Suzanne from Arizona, and Paul is all the way in Australia. So thank you all of y'all for coming on the show today. Suzanne, am I right? You're in Arizona. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Phoenix, Arizona. Excellent. Well, we're, we're just so glad that y'all could come today. Uh, we've Matthew and I have been very blessed with our lay sodality, which What's the number right now, Matthew? Is it 300 people in the... Yeah, it's almost show? 400 people, thank you. 400, okay. Close. And, and it's really, it's international. As we as you can see here, we've got two from the States, one from Aussie land. So we're we're just very, we're just thrilled that this this started and we've, we've continued to grow. But now we have the second edition. So here's the second edition of the book. This is the Definitive Guide to Catholic Fasting and Abstinence, second edition. This has just been released by Matthew Pleasy. So Matthew, can you tell us a little bit about the new edition of the book? Yeah, I'm happy to. So as, as you can see, and as you would know, the book is probably about double the size of the first edition, as you can attest to. So it's not a second edition where some people roll out one and they say, well, I changed some words and moved some around and I corrected some grammatical things. No, when I launched the first edition of the book last year, I wanted to get it out before Lent because I know that's when everybody's talking about fasting. That's when everybody's interested in it. And that's when we, you can get the movement going. So I released the book then to go over really the history of fasting and how we can rediscover this lost part of our heritage. The second edition of the book allowed me the opportunity to continue on to do the additional research that I did not have the time to do for the first edition. So it's nearly double in size. Additional topics that I'm happy that, that were factored into the second edition are much more in the Eastern churches. We have Maronite fasting discussed. We have Armenian fasting. We also show that the decline in fasting was not just an American phenomenon, which I address very uh, strong in the first edition. I show through Spain and the Bula de la Cusada history how Spanish uh, tradition kind of got rid of fasting much earlier on and how that took on in the whole Hispanic world. So that's why South Americans typically don't do a lot of fasting. That's also why the Philippines lost fasting. So I address these. I also address the physical benefits of fasting that God really shows us that we can actually benefit quite significantly physically and mentally from fasting. I talk about the environmental benefits. I talk about all kinds of uh, different controversies, like was chocolate a liquid or was it a solid? That's something the church actually debated. What is actually meat? Is a beaver meat? Is a capybara meat? And what were the sides? Is puffin, the bird, actually meat or not? Does it depend how long an animal's in water? These all show that fasting, as was robust as it was practiced very early on in the church, People just wanted to keep making exceptions and say, well, this thing isn't actually uh, an animal for this purpose, or this day doesn't count, or it doesn't count in this country. So the history is much more robust and much more global in this edition. And I also have a lot more information at the end on practical guidance and how shared days of penance are much more efficacious than simply personal penances. That's why we're in this. That's why we want to be part of this shared group of penance. We want our priests to come out and say, hey, everybody, observe traditional fasting as our forefathers did not under pain of obligation but because we can do something for souls so i address that and i address other things like exemptions from fasting and absence it was really a lot there's a lot of additional topics in here and uh, i'm really happy with how it came out and i really hope that even if somebody picked up the first edition you pick up the second because it is much more of a complete book i think they go really well together and i'm really hoping and praying above all that you read it not just as a history lesson although i find the history quite fascinating because it's not taught even priests tell me 95 percent of it was entirely new to them they had no clue these are traditional catholic priests 
So it's not known, but it's not a history lesson. You, I want you to take it. I don't want everybody to say, wow, this is so much lost. I will voluntarily take up this cross and restore this tradition and discipline in my family. And I want to bring it to my parish or my chapel and my community. And I will help champion fasting because that's the only way we're going to bring it back. Everybody's fighting, thankfully, for the mass, but people don't fight for fasting. So that's why the second edition is so important. Yeah, and, and, and I love, thank you, Matthew, for writing this book, bringing out a second edition. Thank you for your zeal with get, bringing through all these lost customs and traditions. You have another book, Lost Customs, Restoring Lost Custom, that was just released as well. And this is a custom that used to be very common and everybody did it and Catholics just took it for granted, basically, that you fasted for Lent. You mm -hmm. fasted for meat from, from Lent. Um, you, you were hungry during Lent. This is the normal Catholic living of our traditional, of our you actually church. fast a third of the year. That's what you get from the book. Like yes. not even just Lent. Lent yeah, is the great more time if you're not done to go in, but a third of the year is what we're striving for every year getting better, you know? But what I'm really excited about at one Peter five is the lay sodality because it's very difficult to just take this on by yourself and lent has always meant it's always been a corporate fasting where catholic fast together so matthew i want to ask you a little bit can you introduce to us and well first let me ask why should we fast besides the fact that it's traditional and two tell us about the lace and then i want to go to suzanne to tell us about mm -hmm. her experience so matthew why right. should we fast and tell us about the lace Adelia? Well, we should fast because our Lord himself taught us to fast. Not only did he tell us, but he did so by example. So if God can fast, why can we not fast? So, And he told us some demons are driven out only by prayer and fasting. St. Basil the Great, as I talk about in the book, says, your guardian angel is closer to you in proportion to your fast. St. Thomas Aquinas said there's three benefits of fasting, the raising of the mind, you know, to contemplate heavenly things and restraining the passions and ability to make reparation for sin. So these are all part of the reasons why we fast, because the church hallows the practice. The church has the authority to institute fasting days. And beyond the minimum required, we have to make reparation for sin. And fasting is a clear way we can do so because our Lord himself has taught us. So that's why we fast. And I'm really happy that we launched this late fidelity because as I said, it's not just a history lesson. And it's not just everybody living in different silos wanting to do more fasting because if that was the case, then it's not as efficacious as shared days of penance. So we also need to support one another too because fasting can be hard. If you're trying to do this on your own, you feel like nobody else in the world is trying to observe these older fasting days that have been lost. You feel isolated. You probably feel hungry or you feel like that's not part of a community. But no, we are part of a united Catholic church and we are trying to do what we can to restore this. So many people are fighting for the traditional mass to be restored, traditional doctrine, which is wonderful and which is great. But people need to do more to fight for fasting. So that's why we have the lay fidelity, because we want lay people to say, I can do something and I will do something and I'm joining the cause. Just, just if you go to onepeter5.com slash fast, this has this has all the rules and all the tiers and how to join. The Fellowship of St. Anthony, or I'm sorry, Fellowship of St. Nicholas, our patron, St. Nicholas, who's a great faster, uh, uh, lesser known. Uh, and there's yeah, also he a fasted Spanish even from too. his infancy as an infant every Wednesday and Friday. Can you imagine that? An infant refusing, you know, uh, milk yes. and substance on Wednesdays and Fridays. That's why he's our patron. Yes. It, also for Spanish speakers, you can you can click on there's a Spanish version as well. The whole Spanish language sodality as well. So uh, I want to ask Suzanne first. Uh, and I know Su Suzanne's uh, got her kids, so she might need to bow out pretty soon here. So Suzanne, thanks so much for coming on the show. Can you tell us a little bit? Of, why did you join the lay sodality and what has been your experience? Um. Well, just a, I joined the lay sodality by, well, I was actually was voluntold. <laughs> like, here, you're just going to join this group. I'm like, not another group. I can't do another group. But then I just muted it. And then I found myself coming back to the group and reading and unmuting it. And the education that I can attest to the ignorance of the lady had no idea. It's only been a couple of years since we've been fasting on Wednesdays and Fridays and then fasting on the Ember days throughout the years. And um, so 
I'm usually pregnant or nursing. I'm not quite fasting. I'm probably at a tier negative four. Um, <laughs> not even, I haven't even reached like ground level zero. But um, I, I stayed because there's so much of the history and knowledge and clarification to where people are constantly like, oh, the Feast of the Immaculate Conception is, it falls on a Friday, but it's a feast day. So we get to eat today. And I'm like, I don't know. Oh, let me go back to the fellowship group and let me see. And then somebody posts in, I'm like, yes, thank you. Perfect. Here's my answer. And then I can take that to my family and my friends or whomever and say, well, this is what is taught. Take it for what it's worth. And it helps me and my husband, who's also in the group, to just really kind of solidify what we're doing. And it's not, um, we, with the family, the October 31st is not a feast day. And so eating tons of candy is not what happens on October 31st. And so it kind of is a default for us as parents to say, my rule, <laughs> I'm just doing what Holy Mother Church tells us to do. And so it gives us a support truly to parent and um, have a support in fasting. My husband does fasting and he's he, the abstinence and he's great at it. And so there's that definitely the fellowship that comes along with it. And, you know, the old saying, misery loves company. Uh, absolutely. Thank you so much, Suzanne. Uh, it, it, it is really transformative to fast together with other people. And as you say, many yeah. traditional Catholic mothers are pregnant or nursing for a great deal of, of their year, uh, often. And there are exceptions. The church right. has allowed these things. So this that, is that, actually, that, I'm glad you mentioned go it, because this unhealthy. is in the second edition of the book. So that's ex because of people like you with great questions. That's why there's a whole section in there on who is exempt and the church always said pregnant mothers and nursing mothers are exempt from fasting, but not from abstinence. And that was it's, the traditional teaching for a long time. Right. And, and I'm thankful for that. It's the mental shift from going to we don't eat meat on Fridays um, to unify us with, with Christ to I'm pregnant now I can eat meat is really difficult. But because I just because I'm pregnant doesn't mean I don't unbelieve in suffering with Jesus. Right. But now I have to switch the type of suffering to, well, you do have to eat meat because you have a baby or you're growing a baby. And But to have the group be in support of that it is encouraging and helpful. Right. Yeah. The church always traditionally said that pregnant women and nursing women still had to abstain, but they did not have to fast. So that's why fasting and absence are always quite separate Definitely. but i'm glad you mentioned wednesdays and fridays too that's something so many people just don't even know about you know we fast traditionally for a long time even 11 centuries i talk about in the book under obligation on wednesdays because that was the day our lord was betrayed and nobody really associates wednesday with betrayal anymore or saturday many places even even in america until the 1800s saturday's days of absence why because christ was dead and he lay in the tomb and why should you celebrate when that was the day when he was still dead so when you lose those penances connected with days of the week, as you note, you lose that meaning. So no matter where you are in life, I'm glad you mentioned that, pregnant or not, or labor or not, you should do some sort of penances throughout the week. And maybe you do need to adjust those, people do, but you don't want to lose that connection to the liturgical week or day or year. That's living liturgically. Yeah, and we want to emphasize this is this is a voluntary lay sedalia. I think some traditional Catholics can also get scrupulous that this is a voluntary fasting. So we're adding this on voluntarily. So even if we fail and we need more or whatever, it's you know it's difficult to take this on all at once as well. So it, it's not yes. even a venial sin to break any of these. Yeah, that's why we have different tiers, and we're doing above. Uh, obviously, the church requires a minimum, and that church minimum is obviously under pain of sin. You know, Friday abstinence and you know, Good Friday and Ash Wednesday fasting. So that's still, of course, under pain of sin. We're talking about going above and beyond that through many different tiers. And if you're new to this and you're like, that just sounds too hard, just start at tier one and work your way up. Even personally, over the years when I started trying to do traditional fasting, I've been doing it now for, you know, six, seven such years. I did not start at the, what is currently tier three. I worked my way up 
over time. And every year I try to make Lent a little harder. And I encourage everybody, may I say, may every Lent be a little harder, a little more holy, a little more penitential. So you have something to work towards. You don't have to go, you know, St. Francis of Assisi eating half a loaf of bread for Lent, and that's all you eat. So this is right. not what we're encouraging. We're easing in over time, and we're trying to do better because obviously we want to do that purpose of getting holier, better contemplation, freeing up time for prayer, making reparation. That's what it's about. Yeah, and don't forget the the traditional Catholic beers that were brewed specifically for Lent because they have more calories. So that's that's a fun tradition. That's true. That's also Suzanne. mentioned in the second edition. Yeah. Not the there we first. go, second edition. Suzanne, anything else you want to share? Uh, I'm going to go over to Paul in a minute. Um, well, just thank you. I do really, we really appreciate the group and the, and again, the history behind it. And um, I'm glad that somebody dumped me in the group and I'm happy to stay and, and take what I can and be with everybody passing through this, this life. So thank you. And I, I'll drop out now. So thank you so okay, much well, for th everything. Thanks so much for, for being thank here, you. Suzanne. We really appreciate you. And thank you for being in the group. Much appreciated. Yes. Thank you. Bye-bye. All right. So, um, so you can join the group by clicking the link below. It's on Telegram. That's how you join the group. So next, I want to ask Paul, who is over in Queensland. Paul, tell us about why did you join the fellowship? What has been your experience? I joined because I was looking for something more, um, something more in my prayer life. Um, I had been, um, you know, I got into a routine of prayer and I, um, last, uh, Last Lent, I didn't know about this subdality, this group, and um, I had probably made it one of my better Lents um, for quite some time. And, um, and you know, seeing the crisis unfolding in the church, I really wanted to do something more. And, and um, I've been doing Wednesday and Friday um, abstinence and fasting, um, or kind of a mix, but um, yeah, I, I just wanted to find out a bit more about it. and. Um, Somehow I got a link to the um, the to the page the um, the um, page on one Peter five and um, jumped into the group and um, it, it was good I, I was uh, seeing other people who were um, experiencing the same sort of uh, questions as me and, um, and um, you know you're wondering if you get a bit getting a bit too scrupulous and saying you know. Um, like Matthew mentioned, uh, chocolate, and um, you, you wonder, you know, I, I grew up with the Novus Auto, and so, you know, um, I, I was pretty shocked a couple of years ago when I heard that it was the canon law um, was still in place, that abstinence was a thing on Friday, and I'm like, what? You mean we actually have to observe that? Um, and so, you know, okay, so I do. Um, and, yeah, so I was looking to... Um, to really strengthen that, I'm I'm a terrible faster. I I um, I, uh, I I I need encouragement to to actually, you know, last the fast. And uh, so I I found that it helpful that um, you know the questions were being answered and really obscure things had come up even recently. Um, yeah, I, I just can't remember what that that question was, but you know, sorry people were saying sorry I'm asking this, but you know but is this still a case? And, and Matthew would always come back with the answer, or usually a link to um, to uh, something that he'd already written. And um, yeah, it, it, it's been very helpful in that way. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. I really appreciate you sharing. Thanks for coming on. It's uh, 2 a.m. in Aussie land right now, so we really appreciate you. And all of our Aussie friends, Kiwi friends over in your area, Filipinos too, um, I, let me just introduce, I wanted to just talk a little bit about the tiers real quick. And then I want to go to Wes about some, uh, sort of brass tacks here. So once again, if you go to one Peter five.com slash fast, you get all the rules. And so what, what, uh, Matthew did here is he set up these tiers. So what you can do tier one is the level one, basically. And then there's also tier two and tier three. And this goes through the entire year. Obviously, Lent is the focus of fasting for the year. But there's, as Matthew said, there's all sorts of other fasting traditions. So what does this even entail? So what this is, 
tier one. So this is the bare minimum. What this is, is is it takes the 1917 Code of Canon Law as a minimum, but it removes what's called partial abstinence. This is when this was in 1741. So this is actually going really further back to 1741 so that we can abstain totally from all flesh meat for the duration of Lent. That's every single day of Lent, beginning on Ash Wednesday, all the way through Easter Sunday, including Sundays. And let me tell you, if you've never done that, that meat on Easter Sunday tastes very good. And it's a, a joyous feast when you've abstained from meat for 46 days. And the other thing is that it includes fasting on every day of Lent, except for Sunday. Sundays, you can't eat meat, but you don't have to fast. So you you can eat multiple meals on Sunday. You can eat a, much more on Sunday. But that way, you're, you're, you are fasting for 40 total days because Lent is 40 days, the 40 days, 40 day fast of Lent. Uh, Matthew, anything you want to add about these tiers before I ask uh, Wes? Yeah, um, so um, just a few things. So you can look through those. You can understand, you know, kind of how they work. But um, again, Paul, thank you for being part of the group. I mean, I'm really glad to have you and people like yourself who have questions. And I'm happy to provide answers to them. So somebody's reading this and they're not sure, like, you know, look, the Vigil of All Saints, Halloween, you know, like Suzanne talked about. I didn't know that was a fascinating, what's the history on that? I'll provide that. So, like, you know, happy to answer those questions. And, and you know, one of those things we're talking about with modifications is just this past, you know, week, we had the day of um, uh, penance for uh, reparation for the sins of abortion here in America and for the defense of human life. So some questions come up like that was an addition, obviously, after 1917. So that's why we're kind of taking it as a minimum and we're making some changes. We're getting rid of partial absence, which was really kind of one of the main things that led to the onslaught of penance uh, really going away because people saw they could make a lot of exceptions. So that's just generally how it works. But it is year long. It's not just during Lent, but Lent is the ideal time to, to do this. And the second thing I'll note is just a little prudential thing. You can eat more on Sunday because Sunday is not a fasting day. But I would encourage people not to go too overboard. Don't be like, wow, this is my day to eat. I'm going to treat it like another Mardi Gras, have three really large meals. You're going to have a really hard time on Monday when you get back to fasting. I think prudentially, two regular sized meals on Sunday are going to be just fine. And you'll find that after it might be very hard for the first couple of weeks, you know, you, because it's not, you're not used to it, but your, your stomach almost like shrinks. You know, you don't need that much food. So you'll find that it gets easier going on. So don't let the initial, 14 or so days, you know, throw you off. You really can do so. And because as we're entering Septuagesima, Wednesdays and Fridays, if you're not already fasting on those days, it's a great idea to fast on and kind of ease into this period. So you don't just go normal all the way to Ash Wednesday. The church gives us this pre-Lenten period as preparation. So let's use it wisely to prepare our bodies physically. Yeah, I want to go through uh, some more practical tips at the end but first wes wes over wes is over in washington thanks so much for being on the show today wes can you tell us about why did you join the fellowship and what has been your experience well yeah thank you for having me um yeah i joined the fellowship um alongside with i guess you know coming into tradition about four years ago um a long story but 10 years ago i, did, I became catholic about so a month next month will be 10 years um and then it was about four years ago when the world was turning upside down um, our family discovered tradition so it was discovered uh, we had a traditional parish that was you know just down the road from us so we discovered that and then it kind of encompasses fasting and abstinence is going with a living liturgically so for our family just kind of going all in with regards to uh how we live our lives how we orient our, our you know our days um having calendars up coming out of our house you kind of see behind me you know liturgy of the home um, i have three young children so it's just you know it's very important kind of what day is today what color is today so i think that kind of encompasses not only for your family and that's for me as a husband and a father, how to lead as a family. So in regards to that, I think applies this fasting and abstinence. And I remember my first uh, uh, Lent going to our traditional Paris, you know, discovering online through different, whether it's one Peter five meaning of Catholic, or it was from the Dr. Taylor Marshall's show about what's a traditional fast and during Lent, especially. So I remember I did the full dive in, you know, just like what Timothy mentioned, and it's hard. It was hard initially. And I think having now done it a couple of times, and then when this fellowship came around, 
having been part of one Peter five, I thought this is great because you have people that are supporting one another. You have questions about like, you know, what, what applies, what doesn't. Um, and then not only did how to do it during Lent, but how to do it throughout the whole year. So I think it's been neat to how to apply it to like visuals of holy days. And I, I think too, um, doing it for our family, like you see like, Hey, this is a day of penance, you know, especially like a uh, Christmas Eve, for example, we just had, um, we, you know, doing the seven fishes, uh, tradition, but this understanding like this is the day of penance and it's purple. And then you have the special holy day the next day to celebrate. So it kind of helps set up for the great celebration, I think. Um, and then I think for me as a, a, as a man, I think it helps level up your, you know, level up your fasting and absence helps like offer up your, your penances, your reparations for your own sins, but the sins of others. Um, and then uh, I actually I was reading a quote this morning from St. Jerome, about how to alleviate our softness of the flesh is only done by fasting. So it's like, well, how can we do that better in the state of our world and the state of the church and things that we can control, right? And so I think it's something where we can apply better fasting, better abstinence throughout the whole year. Um, I think that's something that we can do and, and try to encourage others to do. And through the fellowship, I think it's been great to have resources, information where you can learn. I think I'm just trying to, to take the full dive in and learn about tradition and how to apply it through not only just the customs, but also just like what's the history behind fasting and abstinence and how can we better, how can I better apply that for myself and for my family um, to continue to learn and apply it and just to live, really live a holy Catholic life. I think our parish priests really impress that upon us and at our, our local parish and just like for me, like how can I do that for myself and then for my family? And so with the fellowship, I think it's great just to have as a resource on a day-to-day -day basis, hey, you got a quick message or, hey, your your fellow brethren is, you know, needs prayers because maybe they're struggling with their fasting or abstinence or, or vice versa. I can ask for the same thing and just kind of support one another because it's good to know you're you're not alone in this. Uh, and it's also you're trying to, you're on this, you're on the same journey of trying to do the same thing. I think it's encouraging when you have others that are trying to do the same thing. Absolutely. Thanks so much for sharing, Wes. Can you talk at all about, um, what has been the impact or what do you see as the value of fasting as a father um, or any practical tips in terms of family life with fasting that you can share? Yeah, I think it's neat because even uh, like I have kids that are seven, five and younger. So it's like they, they, know, they know, hey, this is a day of fasting, even like Ember Days. So like if we go to mass as a family, I know it's purple and it's like they know that this is a day of fasting. We're not going to have meat or even my you know, my seven year old. He just had his first Holy Communion, but he's a one he's wanting to observe those things as well. And will like, you know, in Friday absence, but even other things or he's even we're already had conversations about Lent, you know, and like what things to give up. So I think it's just when they know that as a, as a father that you're doing that. And then also if it's like you're, you're trying to live the out these practices, I think it's important as your family sees this. Uh, you know, your wife and children, but then, then for myself, how can I, you know, grow in my spiritual life and holiness and what things can I offer up through fasting? So I think the impact on myself, but then also what others see on a day-to-day -day basis and they know on the count, they, they see the calendar or it's talked in conversation or when we do our evening prayer, it, it's like even the, the words of the prayers that's mentioned, you know, it's fasting. And I know as they get older, I mean, I notice that this becoming of like reading the prayers and stuff that they'll notice it as well. So I think the impact of just having fasting be a regular thing. It's not, oh, oh man, I got to fast. It's like, oh no, this is a great opportunity, you know, and the church, you know, has this on a regular basis in the traditional calendar. And so what a gift that is uh, to not only our individual selves grow spiritually, but for the, you know, them, they can, you know, offer it up for, you know, reparations that they see around the world. And, you know, for our family, our devotion has been the holy face. So for the, you know, the holy face devotion. So having that, you know, even the reparations for the sins, and then doing that and they understand and that, that verb that verbiage even at a young age and hopefully that is you know that carries over time individually for themselves in their own spiritual life fantastic thanks so much wes i really appreciate you sharing uh, i think that there is an immense impact uh this is what i what i've been taught as the father when children see their father doing this like before the age of reason before they're even given all of the, the intellectual aspects of the faith, when they see their father doing something, they are led to imitate that. And I, I certainly felt that way with my own father, and I've experienced that with my own children as well. I think it, it shows this inner strength of the father. Uh, so thanks so much for sharing, Wes. Let's, uh, Matthew, finally, let's talk a little bit more about practical tips let's say somebody's heard this they're like okay great we want i'm i want to be a trad i want to embrace traditional fasting but i've never fasted in in my life other than the 
uh, you know, the main obligations that are currently on the books. Uh, so what practical tips can you share with us to get started, Matthew? Sure. So um, before I do so, again, Wes, thanks for being part of the group. Thanks for sharing all that. It was you know, great to hear. We're happy to help anybody, obviously, who's new to tradition or been in tradition their whole life. I feel like so many people who are traditional Catholics just aren't taught this and it's not known and we need to make it more available to our priests that we want to hear it too. And uh, something you talked about, like observing, um, you know, the holy days, it, you really need to have a fast in proportion to the feast. So that's why Easter is such a big deal. If you used to look at people's records of what did people's holidays were their favorites, Easter used to rank much higher than it does now. Because when you're fasting and abstaining that long, you're really looking forward to it. It means something. You know, it's really powerful. Even like I talk about this in the book, too, and I've talked about it many other times, all the apostles these days used to be holy days of obligation on the universal calendar, and you would observe the day before as a fasting day. So we lose this connection and importance to the apostles when we don't fast beforehand and when we don't go to mass on their feast day. So there's so much to be said about the preparation beforehand is so important to help us live liturgically. You can't just have these holidays throughout the year. And we have many. That's a great thing about being Catholic. We have so many holidays. Non-Catholics tell me, like, what do you mean you have another holiday? You got holidays all the time. Your holidays last for a week at a time, and it's like all happening. But I'm like, yes, we do. But we also have fasting days. You must have both. That's the rhythm and the rhyme of Catholic life that I talked about. So thanks for talking about that. I think that was just important to note. And if you, anybody's listening and they're like, I want to go through some of those practical tips. I want to learn how to how do I experience that. And um, I would say, you know, obviously start small. Start, of course, though, observing what the, what the church always observes. And I think tier one is a great way to ease into that robust life of fasting that I hope people to aspire to, which is fasting about a third of the year and abstaining two thirds of the year. It's important to know fasting and absence are very related, but they are different. Some people use the terms interchangeably. They'll say, I'm fasting from meat on Friday. No, you're abstaining from meat. You might also be fasting. So it's just always important to try to understand that difference. Um, I do believe there should no be no meat ever consumed during Lent. But if if you're like, okay, that's already going to be hard for me. It's going to take a lot of uh, adapting. Maybe then the next year you want to go vegan for Lent, which is further down, obviously, in some of the requirements. But the church always observed vegan practices for Lent. So we're trying to ease into this over time. And that's also why I say Septuagesima is coming up. Use this period to ease into it. The fast on Wednesdays, fast on Fridays. Uh, you can abstain as well. Wednesdays, Fridays, Saturdays to ease into it. Even days you're not fasting, don't go to the buffet or don't have enormous meals. Try to cut down your portion size a little bit over the time. You can eat throughout the day because it's not a fasting day. But when you go from totally normal to fasting like this, it's going to be too much. So ease into it. The church gives us this period of time to prepare. So we should obviously be using it to prepare. And and Timothy mentioned, like, how great the meat finally tastes in Easter when you can finally have it again. And, you know, for, for me, I've been observing vegan Lent now for a few years. That was how I made it harder over time, getting rid of meat for a while and then observing vegan, but having still fish. And then finally, as of now, like one or two years, no fish either. So it's totally vegan. And last this end of last um, Easter, the meal I had after Lent ended was fish. And for me, that was really important because that was the first meal our Lord had after his resurrection when he met his apostles. He had fish with them and he broke bread and he said, peace be to you. So I felt deeply connected to him because he had that same kind of food after his resurrection. So it takes on a whole different spiritual meaning. Lent is the great crucible we must go through. It is how we prove our love for God. And it is how, as Benedict XIV said in the 1700s, it is how we avert the wrath of God. So. It is on us when the rest of the church falls apart and gives into modernism or heresy, or even when traditional Catholics say, I don't have to do it because it's not obligated anymore. Now, plenty of them say that. I just want to do the minimum. Whatever Pius XII said at the end of this time is fine. I don't need to do more. We're not concerned with the minimum. We want to do more because souls need more. So if nobody else is do it, we will carry the cross for ourselves and our family and for everybody else. And obviously, a very important practical guidance is to pray more. If you're not praying more on fasting days, you're doing it wrong. You know, you have more time 
You need to be devoting more to prayer. You need to be actively offering it up as well. And the money you save from not eating out and not buying this stuff is not to enrich yourselves. The church always said that goes to the poor. So that's how we do the three-legged stool of Lent, prayer, fasting, and almsgiving. They all go hand in hand. So I would encourage anybody to literally start making a list, prayer, fasting, almsgiving, put down things in each column, how you could observe this Lent. Join the fellowship, commit to at least tier one, and understand that you're not alone because a lot of people feel like their Lenten resolutions, if they're really hard, they're alone, but you are not alone. And we are here to pray for and support each other throughout all. Absolutely. Thank you, Matthew. I, I just wanted to make three points and then we'll close off. The first one is what, what I was taught when I was Eastern Orthodox is that the devil doesn't have a body, so he never fasts. And if we ever take pride in this, this is obviously the, the parable of the Pharisee and the publican. Pharisee fasts twice a week, but he's the one who's rejected. So it's important that we keep in mind, we don't want to go around saying, oh, well, we fast or even think to myself that that parable says he prayed with himself. You know, so we're, we're not here to try to take pride in the fact anybody's fasting, but rather try to realize that we should be fasting even more than this for all the sins that we've committed or other people have committed. And we can encourage others by saying, I'm fasting and you should too. Join our group. It's not not that I'm great because I'm fasting, but why don't you join us? You, you can experience this as well. So that's an important aspect of not trying to uh, publicize it in a prideful way, but try to encourage others to join in. Um, so that's an important point. And the second point is nutrition. Just a, just a quick kind of uh, tip here is that we all need, I mean, the main thing that you miss in land is protein. You need protein. So you need to get protein in, like if you're doing tier one, you would get, you can use dairy in tier one, but if you're doing tier two, then you're totally vegan. Uh, now, so you need to get a, you need to get protein. You not only need protein, but you need a complete protein because not all plants give you that complete protein. You don't need all 14 amino acids in a protein. Now, one of the easiest ways to get this in my opinion, is to use Ezekiel bread. This is a, a bread that God actually revealed in the book in the to the prophet Ezekiel, and they make it. They make this special bread that's a combination of all these different sprouted grains and whatnot, and it creates a, a complete protein. So you can you can make Ezekiel bread sandwiches, and they're actually quite delicious. They're they're not. It's not. Let, even if you're fasting vegan, it doesn't need to taste bad. In fact, if it tastes bad, you might not get enough nutrients, enough calories that you really do need for your meal. So you need to make it taste good unless you're, you know, super duper faster. You can just eat bad, <laughs> but it is, it's, it's wise to make it taste good so you can get enough. Uh, so, I mean, I, I really like um, using Ezekiel bread sandwiches because uh, you can use the, you get the cinnamon raisin with peanut butter and jelly. It's still quite delicious, even though it's vegan and you get the full protein. So things like that, you can look up on the internet. You can look up vegan, full, complete proteins, things like that. Uh, I really love lentils. Lentils is a great source of protein. Uh, so you can look this up. You can look up vegan tips. There's tons and tons of recipes and and, and things that you can make taste really good. Now, th then that brings us to the my third tip, and that is uh, this group is obviously online. And what we do online with One Peter Five is meant to we're our 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 goal here is to rebuild Christendom. And the internet is great because it it helps us we can connect across nations and states like we're doing right now. And that you, the viewers, the listeners are connecting with us, which is manifesting a reality about Christendom where we're all connected in the midst of God, body of Christ. But this is, this is meant to support your local parish community. So ideally each one of us who are in this lay sodality, the best thing to do, I think is to take this lay sodality and then create a chapter in your local parish. Get, get some other men who uh, want to do it with you and say, hey, you want to do this fasting with us? So then you can you can have every Wednesday of Lent or every Monday of Lent. You all get together, you do stations or, or you do Friday, or, and then you eat that Lenten meal. I mean, we're, we're this year we're doing it uh, we're doing it on Wednesday nights because we're all, people are already abstaining for, for Friday, obviously. But it's very helpful when you meet together in person and you eat a Lenten meal, it's it's even more beneficial than having the online community because the online community, we're just here to support your local parish community. That's where the rubber really meets the road. 
So I encourage everybody to uh, do this, not only with our lay sodality at 1peter5.com slash fast, but also get people in your local parish to join in and, and get, get something regular going through Lent. So Matthew, last word, any uh, final thoughts you want to add before we close out? Well, uh, just one thing to, to what you said with the complete uh, vegan um, proteins. So they, they do sell that Ezekiel bread at certain stores, so you don't even need to make it. Like I, I know Trader Joe's is where I've gotten right, Ezekiel yeah. bread, so that's that's uh, one thing you do. And I also try to do some vegan protein um, with dinner and a shake. So like with water, put a scoop. There's some totally vegan ones too. So you can you can think about supplementing, and of course, medicine's still okay too. So we don't want people so scrupulous. Like I can't take a can you take like you know your vitamins you know you should be taking your vitamins you should be taking care of yourself with your medicine obviously throughout lent so that's still the case but um again above all i'm really appreciative for everybody who came on really appreciative for everybody who bought the book who buys the book who reads it who shares it it's meant to be shared it's meant obviously not just a history lesson but to be lived out and of course as you say timothy in your own parishes too so please take what you have and learn it and spread it like you know the faith spread like the traditional mass movement spread we need more people saying i can't go around here confessions i can't say mass for people what can i do for the church you can fast you can fast for your priests you can fast for the clergy you can fast for your family and our lord himself if he is god and man of which he is and he chose to fast and he's experienced physical hunger and pain who are we not to experience it too so we should voluntarily want to share in the same suffering if our redeemer wanted to share in that one too amen wonderful well wes and paul we really appreciate you coming on thank you so much for being a part of the fellowship and thanks for sharing your experience with us today yeah thank you for having us thank you. grateful for the opportunity excellent so with all things we should offer this all to our lady this is our patroness here, our chief patroness really at, at 1 Peter 5. She's the patroness of everything we do here at 1 Peter 5. And this is this is part of our one of our other efforts is the Russian icon of the Theotokos of Fatima. And this is the icon that we promote. You can go to 1peter5.com slash Fatima icon to buy the icon, which, which supports the building of the Shrine of Our Lady of Fatima in St. Petersburg, Russia. And... We want to offer these, these, all these penances and fastings to Our Lady because she's the one who purifies them of all their imperfections, of you know, the shades of pride or various things that our own weaknesses and things that we're trying to, to uh, overcome. So let's offer up a Hail Mary uh, to end this. And we encourage everyone to join the, the fellowship. Go to 1peter5.com slash fast. Matthew, can you pray the second half of the Hail Mary for me? Yes. Let's pray. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Spirit, amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Is with Blessed thee. art thou among women. Blessed is the fruit of thy womb. Jesus. Holy Mary, Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, for sinners now, now and at the hour of our death. Of our death. Amen. Our Lady of Fatima. Pray for us. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.